All right, everyone, the red light is on and we are recording. This is Mark back for another episode of the Veteran Semi-Professional. So today's an interview episode where I'm interviewing a veteran about their life after the military, all in an effort to help you if maybe you're still in and trying to figure out what do I do once I can put my hands back in my pockets, grow out my hair, and start wearing these crazy things called civilian clothes. Or maybe you recently transitioned and are still trying to figure, you know, put the pieces of the post-military life puzzle together. This is the show for you. So I bring people on. We talk about, you know, what their careers have looked like. We talk about the steps they've taken on effort to help you and your family have successful, fulfilling post-military life. Okay. So I'm super pumped for today's guest. Uh, you know, he's the head of a company for a brand you're absolutely going to recognize and has a really fantastic career for us to dig into. Uh, so normally, you know, I, I take the first couple of minutes, you know, we'll kind of talk about the person's career and everything, but we do have a little bit of a compressed timeline. And so kind of going to breeze through some of Stort's background, just kind of give you an idea of some of the, the the company he's worked at and like the levels he's been at. And then we've got some uh, some great stuff to dig into about his career. So our guest today is uh, Stuart Hazelton. Okay. And he's the CEO of Arcturx, which is, you know, a very popular premium outdoor gear brand. I actually I just texted one of my buddies. He's a real big rock climber and also an army veteran. I'm like, Hey man, I'm, I'm interviewing Stuart. He's like, Oh my God, this is so cool. This is awesome. This is, this is fantastic. Cause he just loves your products. Okay. But Stuart has been in the C-suite at Arcturx, Away, which is a you know a fantastic you know luggage company, uh, Lululemon and and J Crew, so some huge brands, a lot of brands you probably recognize. So, Stuart, if you could take a minute and just introduce yourself to everyone, that'd be awesome. Yeah, thanks, Mark, uh, and and uh, great to be to be on the show, so to speak. Hope I can offer some interesting nuggets along the way here. Um, yeah, you know I am. Uh, from the the southeast of the U.S., Charleston, South Carolina, originally undergrad at Auburn, uh, four years active duty, uh, most of it in uh, in Germany uh, with First Armor Division, um, and then transitioned uh, into the civilian business world uh, through uh, an MBA program at uh, Tulane University uh, in New Orleans, uh, and then. 20 plus years in retail and consumer brands uh, kind of brings me to, to the spot I am now, and you, which you kind of highlighted. So really honored and privileged to be part of Arcteryx Equipment, a uh, great company here in British Columbia, you know, really draws, draws me into a lot of things I just love to do in my personal life. So it's great to be able to combine my passion for the mountains with, uh, with my work. Um, so I feel really lucky. That's awesome. And and I'll say too, so, you know, we, we connected through a, a mutual acquaintance and I was actually at my first ever Tulane football game about two months ago. Uh, it's a, it's a small stadium, but man, it was so much fun. It's just such like a, a condensed, like college football atmosphere is like very fam family friendly. It was awesome. We had an absolute blast. Yeah. Great year so far for the green way. Yeah. Too, so. Yeah. 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 They're doing well. Awesome. So I, my first question is always just, you know, you, you said you were, you were a cavalry officer. Is that correct? Armored cavalry. Yeah. Four yeah. years, uh, you know, active duty, three of it in Germany. I was a platoon leader um, in the Div Cav squadron uh, for first armed division, which um, uh, is sort of a heavy squadron, heavy battalion size unit. Um I com I was I led a platoon a ground pl platoon that had it was a bit of a, a experiment the army did after the first Gulf War um, I had three M1 main battle tanks and five Bradleys it was a, what they called a three by five platoon thirty five soldiers and um, yeah really really great experience um, and uh, you know life shaping in many ways yeah and, and what was what was your personal transition from the army like? Like what was the, the the good, bad, ugly sideways and like what were some speed bumps and also maybe bright spots that you might want to point out to anyone coming behind you? Yeah, you know, I I um you know, enjoyed my time in the military and made the decision to to you know, pursue a, a business career and had no I, had, I knew nothing about business. I, I had a couple of accounting classes undergrad. That was it. And I went through, I, I kind of looked at two paths. I looked at, you know, uh, one of the recruiters, uh, folks may, may know if it's still around called Cameron Brooks, which was, a uh, you know, a popular path, you know, where they placed you with companies that recruited, uh, military officers. 
Um, and I, I did some interviews with them and, and considered, you know, that, that journey. Um, and then I also looked at, you know, going back and getting an MBA and, uh, as a, as a way for me to actually learn about business, uh, do, do a, a couple internships, try to feel out what, where my interests lie, uh, versus the, the recruiter path, which was, you just sort of like, you know, jump into the deep end and, and hope for the best. So I, I kind of ended up for a few different reasons, deciding to go the MBA route. You know, I won't lie. The idea of two years in, in New Orleans was pretty appealing, you know, as a student, you know, you know, after you spend some time, you know, on active duty and, and uh, that it had a lot of appeal, just I'll say it that way. And, uh, um, and it didn't disappoint. I had a great two years in New Orleans at Tulane uh, personally, it was just a ton of fun. And then from a professional standpoint, um, it did exactly what I hoped it would do. It, it helped me build some skills. Uh, I, I focused on a finance concentration so that I, I felt like I could, I could actually build something that, um, would be part of a, a toolkit I could bring into the business world. Um, and then I was able to network. I was able to, to do a couple of internships, one at Shell Oil, uh, and then one at um, a local uh, non-for-profit. Um, and uh, it helped me, you know, begin to triangulate on what I didn't like and what I did like. And ultimately, I kind of came out of the military saying, you know what, I, I like leading teams. I like, like solving problems. I like managing resources. Um, how can I do that in the civilian world and find something that I like? And I wasn't really stuck on any particular industry. Um, I knew I didn't want to be a banker. I didn't want to be an accountant. You know, I didn't want to, you know, be pigeonholed into marketing or something like that. I was, I was looking for a path that could lead me into a broad, a broader role and ended up going into consulting right out of MBA school. Um, and, you know, interestingly, after all that work, uh, hated consulting. <laughs> I just, I, I was in Chicago. I love Chicago, great city but I was on the road. I was, I was, and what I didn't like about consulting was it never, I never owned a decision. I, I was always helping other people make decisions and other people, you know, run their businesses. And I wanted to be the guy sort of driving the bus, so to speak. And so I left, um, and interrupt me at any point. If there's oh, questions. no, no, please, please. I, I, the, uh, the one place I'll interrupt here, well, two things I'll interrupt on. Uh, so one, my fiance is actually from New Orleans and I'm getting married in New Orleans in, in January. So I uh, love the city, fantastic place. And then I think like what you're kind of talking about here with consulting is something that I I bring up when I'm, when I'm talking with veterans a lot in particular, you know, I, I just finished up at Darden. And so people kind of come to me a lot asking about business school and everything. And that exact dynamic is something that I've heard from a number of veterans who, you know, spend some time at consulting is that aspect of not really owning the decision. And I think particularly, you know, if you're kind of fresh from the military, you know, you're used to being in front of that formation and saying like, we're going to go left. And then, you know, that, that three by five platoon, those 35 soldiers like, all right, so like, we're going left. We're going to, we're going to make it happen. Right. And consulting is more, here are the reasons why I think you should go left. And then ultimately, you know, someone's going to, someone else is going to make and kind of implement the decision. And that's a very broad generalization. But I think it's an important dynamic to understand as an individual of like what what do you like to do and how is that going to look into you know what that job actually is. I, yeah, great, great insight. And and you know a lot of people enjoy consulting, and certainly I've hired a lot of consultants over the years and, and rely on them in important ways. Um, so it's more personal preference for me. I I wanted to be involved in execution and and sort of driving driving the, you know, the decisions, uh, to, to, a you know, a, a result. Um, so I, I did that for not long, like a little over a year. It was a strategy, small boutique strategy consulting firm in Chicago. And then I just crossed paths with, with an old friend who was at Saks department stores. And she sort of described that company and what they were doing and, and that they were looking for someone who in their their financial planning team um, that had the you know the the credentials that that I had uh, more from the business school and then sort of this sort of abbreviated experience as a consultant. So I, it was a, close to an entry level job into Saks department stores in the planning department, and 
that and the thing that um, was most important to me in taking that job were the people that I met at Saks. And the the guy that I went to work for was actually also an army veteran. He he was an MP, served in the first Gulf War, and I ended up working for him for 15 years. And he's he's still somebody that's you know like family to me today. Um, so those personal connections are are really critical. I would I would say that to anyone in any career path that, that, you know, it's as much about, you know, how you set yourself up and, and, and make decisions on the direction you want to go. It's, it's equally as important as the, the people that you are able to, to forge relationships with and, and, and partner with, and those mentor relationships are just super critical and, and finding their finding ones that's, that work in both directions uh, is really important. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's sort of thumbnail of how I kind of got from the military into the, into the sort of the business world, the retail world specifically, I ultimately fell in love with the retail industry, consumer products industry. Uh, and that was the beginning of, you know, a, a really great career. And what was it specifically about retail and consumer products that was, that was, you know, intellectually stimulating to you? Yeah, it's, um, it's cutthroat capitalism. It, there's there's very low barriers to entry. Um, there's no government regulation. It's all about who has the best product and the best experience at the right time at the right price. So it's super dynamic and you're reinventing in retail, you're reinventing your product line basically every six months. And so it is constant change, constant competition. Uh, and I find that it's in, because of all those, those factors, it's more dependent on strong leadership than other industries where there may be great technologies that are being you know, discovered and, and scaled. Retail and consumer brands are all about, in my view, strong leaders who are able to have a vision and execute it. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious of like what aspects, you know, you know the, the path I'm kind of hearing that you wanted to take was getting into positions where you know you had the ability to to lead a team to make decisions to you know implement a vision. What did you take from you know your 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 time in the army that you then kind of translated into those positions as you started getting into you know those those leadership managerial roles where you were the one you know making a call, implementing something, and like executing a vision with the team. Yeah, you know, I I would say there's. Um... Things that I, benefits I took out of the military that I think will resonate with anyone who's, who's, who's served. First of all, there's that um, really serves me well, even to, di- even to this day, where those those elements, um, I mean, that, that those points of personal. Story, you're, you're breaking up context. on me. There we go. Sorry. It, that, that, that last little bit of your answer just, just broke off right there. We had a, some type of the, the satellites crossed over each other. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies. It's probably my network connection here. Um, but I would say there's in, in response to that, there's, um, I would, disc- I would answer it in two two categories. First is sort of the personal resiliency that anyone who served, you know, brings into all parts of their life where, you know, I, I find myself in quote unquote tough business circumstances, but I, you know, I always, I always can remind myself that I, I slept in a bed, I had a hot meal and my feet are dry. And it, it, it sounds silly, but that just grounding, it always puts everything into context and perspective. This, the other element I would say is more from a you know leadership standpoint, there are some fundamental leadership principles and ideas that you learn as uh, you learn in the military that are they become almost how you're wired. And I don't even think about it anymore. But it's things like leadership by example. Um, I, I'm always aware and cognizant of how my personal example is, will influence my teams. And the second element is, is teamwork itself. It's just like how I put my, the, the needs of my team first, how I, I'm attuned to the personal dynamics across my teams at, at all levels, 
uh, so, so that they're, we're setting the stage for, for winning, for success, so that the teams felt, feel supported. They feel clear on the commander's intent, if you will, what their, what their mission is, what their, what their definition of success is. Um, so it's just the, that the notion of the, the focus on the team and ensuring that the team is set up for success and that the needs of the team come first. And then my own personal example in supporting that are things that are with me constantly day in, day out and, and have served me well over, over my career, um, is really, you know, how I, how I approach work, how I approach, uh, you know, every role I've had. Yeah. I think that's really, if, if you refer one, the, the, the example of, you know, I had a hot meal today, my, my feet are dry and I got to sleep in a bed that that's come up multiple times from people of just that it's a very simplistic grounding, but at the end of the day, you're like, you know what? This could always be worse. Like I got to go home today. I got to see my family. I got three, I got three meals, you know, no, no one's shooting at me or anything. Like it was, it was, it was a good day. Like this day could have been way worse. And being able to have that, that perspective as, a, as, as a veteran is, is super helpful in anything you're, you're going to do post-military life. Um, I'm curious, you know, in the last couple of years, we've had this thing called, called COVID, right. And I'm sure that has interrupted operations and everything you all are doing about business. And like, how did you, you know, like when, when the pandemic was kind of first starting, um, how did you think about like managing that situation? And then, you know, how did it evolve over time? Yeah. You know, it, it threw, um, threw us into a crisis. So I, I'll say this, I was at uh, away when this happened. So travel products company mainly sells luggage to people who are going to get on an airplane. Yeah. Um, so our def sales definitely an industry that's going to be impacted by COVID for oh, sure. Man. Yeah. We were, we were crushed. Um, so our sales dropped 90% in a month and, um, it became about like, um, crisis management, uh, just having the liquidity and the financial resources to weather the storm. And, you know, it, it threw us into crisis mode. And what I would say is strangely, I, and I, I do attribute this to my military background. Um, I've always loved a good crisis. Like it, it might sound strange, but it creates focus and clarity and what is needed um, that few things do. So the, the pandemic was difficult, uh, in many ways, but it, it, it created clarity, uh, for us on here's, what's most important here's, and it made it evident here, are the things we need to do today and tomorrow to get through this. Um, and, and I've always secretly relished those moments where, okay, guys, we're going to stay late, order pizza and, you know, and figure this out. Um, it's, it's those moments of, of crisis that just bring people together that, that as I said, create clarity and, and, uh, the work that's needed. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it, the, the, the silver lining in it is that it, it, you know, it, it, it brings people together and it, it, um, helps you emerge stronger. And I have folks on my team as, as we navigate different types of crises, they always say, you know, you never want to squander uh, a good crisis to to build build your team stronger, and so I really believe in that. I, I was just thinking that I can't remember. It's either you know, it's either going to be Lincoln, Roosevelt, or Churchill, or Mark Twain. I guess <laughs> like one, one of those four. One of the, one of, the, one of those four. Yeah. Every every quote gets attributed to like never let good crisis go to waste. But I I totally understand that. Of wow, like the the everything is just like falling apart right now. And like, I have to focus in on like the thing that is right in front of me because yeah. like, it just gives you that, that sense of focus and whether or not that being like that. And that same dynamic can apply in whether it be a business setting or, you know, personal relationships or, you know, your decision to, to get out of the military or, or whatever it may be. Like we, we're all going to kind of have those crises moments. And like, that's when, you know, you get the opportunity to say, what really matters to me here? And how do I really want to come out the other end of this situation? So I think it's a really good way to look at it. Um, so I'm going I'm to pivot a, a little bit to kind of talk about the the, the brand and, and, and you here a bit. But wh what do you like to do outside? Because I'm, I'm sure, you know, you, you took over a, you know, a major outdoor gear company. And like, I'm guessing you love going outside. I I love being on the mountain. So I'm a passionate uh, skier. Um 
and I, you know, I've got three kids. One of the appeals of moving to British Columbia was really the, the proximity to the mountains here. And so there's, um, we're about 90 minutes from Whistler and, uh, and we have three local mountains here in Vancouver, you know, that are 15 minutes away. And, and the Arcteryx office is literally five minutes, you know, from the foot of one of the three mountains that overlook Vancouver. So, um, I, you know, when the snow starts to fall, I just get excited and uh, lo love to be on a mountain uh, in the winter, but also in the summer. So hiking, um, uh, mountain biking, uh, you know, just, you know, the, the summer's almost in some ways um, better because you can, you can access more parts of the mountain. You can, um, there's more you can do. I've begun to learn uh, rock climbing. So Arcteryx is a, is a, its legacy is and its DNA is climbing. And so that's something that I've, I've been excited to explore. So I'm, I'm very much a novice, but uh, great sport. And, and um, another, you know, just incredible experience to have, you know, in the mountains. So, so to answer the question uh, in the winter, I'm a, I'm a skier backcountry as well as on the resort. Uh, and in the summer, I'm on my mountain bike, I'm hiking in the trails uh, and, and now learning to, uh, to rock climb. That's I'm also, I, I, a huge skier myself, love, love skiing and hiking. Those are my favorite things to do. Um, uh, yeah, I live in, I live in Virginia. Unfortunately, like we don't get quite the, quite the mountains out here as the West coast does, but like we, we, we make do with what we got. And I was, I was planning time to go, to go out West and get on some like real mountains out there. Yeah. Got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as a, as a person who enjoys going outdoors yourself and, you know, running a brand that is, really like on the, on the, on the forefront of, you know, top line outdoor gear. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, you all kind of have to like reinvent your product line every, every six months. So how do you think about like staying, staying ahead and like staying on that horizon of we're going to have the top gear and always kind of be, you know, one of those brands that people think of, of, you know, top line outdoor performance gear. Yeah. It's about constantly moving forward. And we, um, cultivate relationships with uh our sponsored athletes and so we spent a lot of time with them hearing their feedback on uh different products that uh they're you know putting putting it through the test for us um and and our design team themselves are pretty amazing athletes and so um what's great about this company is you know we're for the most part designing products that for ourselves you know things that we want and uh, right. it's very personal. And even like on our design team, we have world-class climbers who have competed in Canada and the U S you know, on the national teams for both of those countries. And um, so they, as, when they're de designing a climbing harness or a climbing pack, they're doing it from, you know, an elite, you know, level of, of uh, performance and consideration. So it's uh, but, even then it's all about how do we, how do we improve on what we made last year? And there's a, the motto of the company, the unofficial motto of Arcteryx is there's always a better way. Um, and so we're always lo looking to press forward, always looking to, to make uh, improvements, uh, introduce products that um, solve problems uh, in a different way. Um, so the, so that's the, the philosophy and the ethos of the company. And um you know, sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll have a breakthrough and sometimes it takes us a while to get there, but, um, but it, it's all from a place of authenticity of rarely, we don't sit around and think about, um, you know, market share and, you know, margins, uh, when we're building product, it's all about, um, you know, how do, how do we, how do we create something that solves a problem for a, for an athlete, um, in the mountains, um, we ultimately will come back to figure out those other things. Um, but that's not where we start. Right. Right. I, yeah. I'm kind of curious on that, on that aspect of, um, okay. You know, you have, we have, you know, world-class athletes and designers who are, you know, making things for themselves and, you know, talking with, you know, elite level athletes who are, you know, climbing mountains and skiing and, and doing all these amazing activities out in the wilderness. But at some point then, like, you know, you've got to take these designs and start, you know, operationalizing them w within the business. Can you kind of talk through what, um, and, and this can be like, you know, very big picture, but like, you know, there's, there's a supply chain that kind of goes into that. And like, there's the, the sales and marketing, um, 
if you can kind of give us maybe like a 30,000 foot view of how those aspects tie into the decision-making process for, you know, like a new product line. Yeah. What I'll say is the way we do this is very different than, than most companies. And I think it's part of the secret sauce of our Terex. You know, as I think about when I was a J crew and even Lululemon, it was a more traditional design and development process. Uh, here, our design floor looks like a factory floor. There's lots of machines, you know, there's a lot, lots of machines that we invented, frankly, because there wasn't something on the market that did what we needed it to. Um, so there's a, a, a strong maker uh, uh, bias to how products are, are designed. There, there's not a lot of sketches. Like in the apparel world, that's a, you know, you'll, you'll go to a design floor and you'll see people drawing pictures and that's not how it happens at Arcteryx. There's people on our design floor cutting fabric, sewing it together differently, shaping it for, for different purposes um, and, and building prototypes. So our, our process is really driven by uh, a prototype and iteration. So, and oftentimes it'll be a number of prototypes that uh, try to solve the problem in different ways. And then they're tested vigorously, both in our, you know, in our design center and then on the mountain, you know, on our, our designers, as I mentioned, who are or accomplished athletes, they'll often design something in the morning, test it on the mountain in the afternoon and be back in the next day to, to make improvements and changes to it. So um, that is literally how our, you know, our best products are, are built or designed and developed. Um, ultimately, after that initial prototype is sort of hammered into something that we feel like, okay, wow, we've got something. Uh, then it goes to uh, the next stage, which is what we call our product development and the, the product developers take these rough prototypes and then fit them into a, a, um, a set of specifications that can be reproduced at scale at a factory. Um, so the designers, you know, are creative and they create something cool and, and, um, and functional. And then the developers turn it into something that we can stamp out several hundred thousand of and, and sell with a consistent level of quality and execution. Uh, so the developers then hand it off to our sourcing team who then works with our factories to find the right factory um, and, uh, and, and then work with our merchants who are then looking at you know, margins, where does it fit into the overall assortment? What's the right price point? Um, how much of it do we wanna have? this season, next season, and they're, they're in charge of orchestrating the overall uh, assortment that we offer across all our categories and, and how each product uh, fits into that. No, I think that, that that's super helpful. I, you know, I've had a number of people, um, you know, I've had a lot of guests on the show from the, the tech world, and we, we've talked about you know, putting something out there, doing, doing testing, and how you can kind of quickly iterate, you go back in, change the code and everything, but there's, there's not like it's a similar process in a sense with, with retail of, you know, an actual like consumer good. Um, it just kind of looks a little different, but at the end of the day, like the, the fundamentals are essentially the same, you know, we see a need uh, very often. It's, you know, just like a developer might see, you know, inefficiency in a system and oh, I can write this little bit of line of code to make this a little bit better. An athlete can look at something and say, Oh, well, you know, this, this seam was a little tighter here or this thing, you know, this, the, the hood went over my head just a little bit further it would serve this purpose better. And you can kind of understand what that, that iteration looks like and then push that into the next product offering. And so it's can be a similar process. I, I think in a sense, whether it be tech or retail, it just kind of feels different when they, when you first look at it. Yeah. The, the, the insight, the key insight I'll, I'll, I'll sort of interject here is it all starts and ends around solving a problem. Um, and doing if you're solving a problem in a in a new way in a different way that adds value um, that that in terms of 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 creating creating a solution that doesn't exist in the world um, that is a is an a, a, a robust idea that will that'll that'll work if you're if you're just trying to participate in a market if you're trying to make a product that's like other people have already made that's not very interesting and you're going to struggle actually to stand out in the marketplace and actually win with that product. So if you're solving a problem in any industry, in my view, um, that's, that is a, 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 a substantive place to begin 
uh, with, with any business. I very, very much agree. Like if you've, if you've got, if you can identify a problem and create a solution to that problem, someone's, someone out there is going to, is going to pay you for it. Okay. Uh, if you create a good, exactly. good, reliable solution to that problem, someone, someone there is going to say, yep, I, I want to buy that because it solves X, Y, Z problem for me. Yeah, totally. Okay. You know, you, you talked about, you know, you've been the, the, high level and a number of different, you know, very prominent brands. You said you've got three kids. You like, you like to go skiing and you get out in the mountain and everything. How do, how do you think about bounce in your, your career and then family and life and all, all, everything else you want to go do? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I think it's a different answer for everyone. And so what balance looks like for one person will be very different for another. Uh, for me, it's, I always prioritize, um, time with my family, with my kids. Um, and, uh, that doesn't mean that, um, I don't miss things on occasion. Um, but the, but I, I work a lot of hours and the trade in my mind that creates the balance is that whenever there's an important event with my family, I'll, I'll clear my schedule and I'll make it happen. Now I may have to work late or I may have to work a weekend every now and then. Um, but the trade-off for me is, what it doesn't matter if if one of my kids has has an event i i'm going to change my schedule i'm going to be there and and that's that's how in my mind i keep that balance is that the, the trade is i work a lot of hours in exchange for i get to i get to be at whatever i want to i can't be at everything but i can be at, at whatever i want to be at i i think that's a it's a great way to think about it of you know you can't have you can't have everything so you got to be slightly discerning like where it is that you want to spend time, energy, and effort. And there's going to be, you know, if I want to make that recital at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, okay, Monday and Sunday, I might have to put in some, you know, 18 hour days or whatever to get there, but I can get there. And there is a way for me to be able to manage and and do both effectively. Um, and I think this is also like a good sign for everyone listening to the show of, you know, you can be you know, at, at the top of an organization and still be able to do, you know, have that great career but then also, you know, be able to get out in the mountain, be able to go do things with your family. And like, you, you can find that balance and it's just a, that deliberate effort from you to go through the process in order to, to make that kind of thing happen. I think it's a great lesson for everybody. Yeah, exactly. It, it, you have to make it intentional. You can't let it happen to you. Right. Right. Well, so we're, we're winding down to the, the last few minutes and I want to be respectful of your time here. Uh, so in a minute, I'm going to pass back over to you to provide any, you know, last thoughts, words of wisdom to people as they're kind of thinking about, you know, post-military life. But before I do is a question I always ask my guests and that's, if you think back to your time in the army, what was the best and or worst chow hall you ever ate at? <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, the best chow hall I I was always very uh, envious of the Air Force. They always uh, had the best. They always the win this one. They always win. And, you know, the Army always seemed to have the worst of everything. So it was probably uh, the Rhine Mine Air Force Base uh, in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, had the best chow hall I've ever seen. It was, I, I've never, it was like a, you know, it was like a mall uh, food court. There were so many options. Um and uh, the worst chow hall, and now uh, um, it was probably <laughs> it was probably my squadron's chow hall in Budig in Germany. Oh, no. um, but uh, I'm trying to think of one that was worse, and I can't. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's since been closed. Uh, I think Rhine Mine's still in operation, but. Uh, yeah, the booting and chow hall for one one cav. Um, I'd have to put that one pretty low on the list. Yeah. Well, I will say I, I don't keep an official score or anything. Unfortunately, Air Force definitely has, you know, the, the most W's in this category. Uh, and I have found there have been a couple consistent losers actually of like the same chow hall coming up a couple of times. So, you know, maybe the Department of Defense should should listen to my show and maybe take some of that consideration or something, but I'm not <laughs> I'm not baking on that one anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um uh, well, awesome. So I really appreciate your, your time today and coming on the show and, and, and talking about your career after the army and everything and all, all the wonderful, wonderful things you've been able to do. So I just want to give it over to you one last time, just providing, you know, parting shots, words of wisdom to folks as they're either, you know, planning their transition from the military or, you know, in, in the first couple of years afterwards and thinking about, you know, how to put together the career post-military life. 
Yeah, I my advice would be um, you rely on the network. Uh, other veterans want to help you and um, and and care about your success. So know that um, and don't be hesitant in reaching out to other veterans. Um, and, you know, I, this is really just life advice, uh, follow your heart, uh, find uh, a field that, that, you know, resonates for you and your, you know, your passions are going to help you find things that you're, you're going to, you're going to perform better at and, and don't be afraid, um, uh, to make a mistake. Um, sometimes it, you have to find what you don't like to find what, what, what you do like. And certainly that was the case for me. And I have no regrets on some of the moves I made, even though, you know, it, uh, it, it helped me learn what, what wasn't my thing. Um, so don't be afraid to make mistakes and learn from them. Uh, follow your passion and, uh, and leverage the network, I think would be how I would sum it up. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I always tell people that the veteran network is it's loud and it's proud and it's, it's super helpful. And you know, if I, if I reach out to a Marine, they're going to give me a little bit of crap for being in the army. I'm going to make some jokes about them being in the Marine Corps and that's going to last about like 15, 20 seconds. And then it's going to be, Hey, how can we help each other out? And that, that camaraderie and, and sense of service, you know, that we got from our time in the military, absolutely. Like those bonds maintain and whether or not you got out, you know, a couple of years ago or 30 years ago, people absolutely like want to be there to, to help out the brothers and sisters who served. So um, definitely echo those words. So, so yeah. thank you so much for, for coming on. Really, really appreciate your time today. Um, for everyone listening, please you know, like, subscribe, review the show. Uh, and then also, if you're still in the military and planning your transition, go check out vetjourney.com, a tool that we've built to help you plan your, your post-military life. So Stuart, thanks again for coming on. Appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to seeing where things go. Take care. Thanks, Mark.